All right, John's how are we? We good, Deep Joy? So on this week's episode of the In You Get podcast, we've got someone that fancies himself as a bit of a DJ, but we know him, ex-England rugby international, British and Irish lion. It's none other than James Haskell. In You Get. Hask, how are we? Absolutely delightful, mate. Delightful. Deep, deep joy. Thank you for uh, thank you for, for agreeing to doing this with me, mate. That's all right. It's, oh. I've never been to this part of the world. I've seen it on Channel Four documentaries. Yeah. How the other half live, but it's it's very nice to be here, actually. Yeah, that's right. To be fair, doing this uh, doing this podcast was a little bit your idea, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, I, look, we talked about it. Obviously, I've been a big fan of yours um, from the beginning, and yeah. I just think that it's the perfect medium. You know, the whole point of a cabbie's jobby, cabbie's jobby, <laughs> cabbie's job is obviously part of the time is to interact with the clients, have a talk. You know, most of the good ones, you have that inter- interaction. I think with the like advent of like Uber, dirty word, and all these kind of other people, you've lost that kind of charm. And one of the best things about London is being able to have that conversation. And I think um, it was a perfect medium to put <laughs> legends guilty, in your... Um, <laughs> In your cab and talking about them and the crossovers in in life and a few stories. So yeah, if course. this goes big, yeah, you've heard it on this video. And you're not allowed to cut this out. I want some commish for percentages moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Um, so right nowadays, you fancy yourself as a bit of a uh, international DJ. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it was such a scathing tone. You now fancy yourself. You a fancy bit of yourself. Yeah, I do a bit. Can I ask you where did that where did that love affair first start? Was it from a young age or? No, so I'm um, horrifically uncool. Um, I didn't really have much of a kind of. My parents were listening to Michael Jackson, Tina Turner, kind of, you know, lot, uh, when I was younger, you know, Pink Floyd, all these kind of stuff, Elton John. But I was sort of very oblivious to life. I spent a lot of my kind of early years on a mountain, ba- a mountain bike outside, um, you know, building army bases all i wanted to do was be in the army yeah. uh, dressed up in camo with bb guns like doing raids on my neighbor's um house and stuff well, not actually in the house that was, i wasn't a blue collar burglar but i was um you know a white collar burglar even i was i was it was sort of you know just playing fun and games i was very into sports but i wasn't very culturally aware wasn't very you know i wasn't up with pop culture yeah. you know, the first cd i bought was age 15 brimful of asher on the 45 i only did it because I went with my mates and I used to go to HMV and buy CDs. I didn't really have pocket money as a kid. Gotcha, um, yeah. I, and I wasn't like Oliver Twist, but I didn't, I just didn't have that kind of thing. So um, my mum still, you know, chose my clothing up until the age of 15. I put some clothes out of the bed for you to wear and where I just did, didn't. Where did she go, high and mighty? Oh, <laughs> no, well, <laughs> I was sort of tall and thin then. I mean, but it, it was sort of like, you know, brush your hair to one side before it was fashionable, before you and I started cutting the trend, yeah. um, <laughs> uh, you know, or Peaky Blinders, I should say. And then, you know, sort of high-waisted trousers, just awkward gears. You used to try to dress me as my, like my brother, who's younger. Um, and then basically, I, I sort of then started to become a bit more aware of it. And actually, the, the real love affair of music started when I was probably 16, 17, went to a sports psychologist and was talking about kind of um, how to get consistent performance. So if you're back in the day when people used to play rugby or sport, you had eight games a season, you can do eight games on a motion. You know, you can have that kind of e- easily, readily made com- uh, fire, competitive, um, competitive nature, motivation. When you're playing 30 odd games a season, you're yeah. travelling. You know, you could be tired. You could have an argument with your, your partner. You could be injured. The media could be hammering you. Yeah. How do you consistently prepare? And she recommended putting playlists together with music. So I, I started doing that. We all know when we hear a song uh, that makes you feel a million dollars, or you go, wow, I feel so motivated, whatever it might be. You feel like you've got the biggest knob in the world when you go yes. to a club and you hear your tune, don't you? Uh, yes, yeah. yeah. I, well, <laughs> I, I feel like that anyway, but I, <laughs> I just mean, you know, like, uh, you know, sunshine, and you get in your cab, you put on the radio, and so, something comes on, you're like, oh, today's going to be a good day. Yeah. Obviously, a lot of people, you know, back then didn't used to listen to music before games. So when I, I used to put this playlist together, I was one of the only people on the team bus wearing headphones. So is, was that? Is it because it was frowned upon by management and they didn't like it? Yes, they basically right. thought that if you were listening to music, you weren't concentrating in the zone. Yeah, in the zone. You know, if you if you were in the changing room and they were talking and the, and the captain was talking, you had to listen. And I got loads of criticism on from the old heads. 
get your, get your headphones off, fucking, you know, you're not listening. Yeah. And so it got to the point where I ended up, you know, got I used to have big cans, got them smaller and smaller until I was wearing just inner ears and I'd have one out so they could see me. And yeah. then I would be looking at notes as well would match up to the music kind of thoughts about that specific game. And yeah. they were like, look, um, you know, you're not concentrating, you know, buries your head in notes. So when the, the first iPod came out, there was a function you could actually put notes on it. So I had the notes on the iPod so people didn't know I was doing it. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, and then basically the music kind of built up to the point where I started to then go to Las Vegas um, in the off season. You walk into those pool parties, you know, beautiful people, a man standing at the front, a woman standing at the front, controlling everyone's vibe. Yeah. And I just thought, do you know what? I love the music. I love attention. I'm a massive attention whore. Why would I not want to go and do this? And so I started looking into DJing. And it turns out a lot of people who uh, were into rugby uh, were DJs. So Simon Dunmore from Defected Records, Jaguar Skills, um, Seb Fontaine, all these guys were really into music. So I, I sort of started doing a bit and I, I reached out to a few of them and they gave me some, some lessons. But a lot of the way I learn is, is very much about doing a through a process-based thing. Yeah. I'm not overly creative. You know, like artists sometimes can just do stuff. So I started doing a course um, at, a, at a place that's called Sub Bass that's now, um, now extinct. And um, my first gig, if you finish the course, was at Ministry of Sound. And I wow. did a Ministry of Sound on the balcony. And I, I did it, absolutely loved it, shit in my pants. Um, and through that process, I, I kind of used music continuously while I was playing, but my music taste changed. And I remember my first playlist had like cold play, Oasis, The Wanted, yeah. all that stuff on. By the end of it, it was all very housey into techno kind of music. Yeah. Um, and that journey kind of progressed. And I, I remember getting my first, DJ, I went to get a DJ agent, the guy was a bit of a prick and he was like, you know, why are you into DJing? And I was like, oh, because I just want to perform. He's like, good, because you won't fucking make any money. And I was like, all right, well, I just want to do it. You know, that's what did I want to do. Did you just say that or did you say, like, shut up, your mum? <laughs> no, 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 I've actually, when people are, when I respect people or like, they're in a position of kind of power. Remember my whole life has been teacher-pupil relationship. You know, always at school, yeah. but at coaching. So I'm quite respectful in that re regard. Now I've, re now I've retired and I don't have a boss, it's very difficult for me not to tell you to fogo fuck yourself because I, I don't have to worry about it. There's no repercussions yeah. of it. It's like me trying to tell you how to work along the back row and how to ruck. Do you know what yeah. I mean? It's like... Well, I, I, John, I'd, I, I, if you... I'd listen to what you had to say. Yeah. And if you made, you know, there might be something in there that I'd take out of it and I'd be respectful. If you, uh, I find it hard when fans who know nothing about anything, who've never experienced it, don't understand the pressure, are sitting in the safety of their stand, their living room. Yeah. Can see, I mean, we can all see what we should be doing, but it's one thing to be doing it and, uh, in the moment and change 14 other people on the field's minds at the same time to, to conform. So, but they miss all those kind of nuances. Um, I bet the fans, I bet the fans are different because I mean, like when, when you've played, like obviously rugby union, international rugby and all that, you've got, if you've had a shit game, you'll get told about it. Yeah. Whereas if you've had a shit set, I, 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 I don't know, I think people are so off on their fucking rocker that they're, they're so turboed up that they won't tell you you were shit. Do, do you know what? Actually, a lot of the time um, with the DJing stuff, it surprises people a lot because they don't think I'm actually doing it. Right. So when they see me doing it, mixing it, using three decks, putting the song choices together, they're like, wow, you can actually do it. And look I get that, that look a lot. at that fucking big bullock. Look yeah, at him. yeah, exactly. And they say, but they say actually you can do it, which is good. Um, you'll get one guy, you know, get a couple of people just go, you shit, no, you shit. Yeah. But That's they, jealousy. That's just, just yeah, jealousy. They're just going to sell it to, sell it to anybody. Um, and I, what, I've, I pride, uh, you know, um, I sort of, uh, you know, take the same view that I took into rugby into DJing about the performance thing, about perf uh, doing a set, yep. dismantling it again, reviewing it, I record everything, see what I could have done better, reach out to people who do stuff better than I do, look at videos. Um, and it's got to the point where I've done some pretty cool stuff with the DJing. It's very hard to get to those credible gigs and be seen as credible because I will always be a Z-list celebrity yeah, DJ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you make the music, which I've started to do, and, and, and the sound that I want to find, I think they can get you some more credible stuff. And, and for me, that's my, my real journey. You know, there's so much good that I can do that I've learned from rugby, which is the determination, yeah. which is the work ethic. But I'm going into an unknown world where, you know, it's very, un you know, you can't quantify all of it. You know, you see in the media world yeah, and stuff like, yeah. why does one video do better than another? Yeah. Why does one joke work better than another? Yeah. It depends on so many variables. All you can do is be consistent and consistently deliver. Sometimes I, f I find that when, I, like when I've done a video, I, th I think to myself, yeah, that weren't actually that great but it fucking does yeah. unbelievably. And then something that I think, yeah, that was the bollocks. And I'm like, hardly got any, yeah. any sort of views or any sort of feedback. So you're, you, 
the way you look at life and the way you sort of attack the way you do your DJ stuff, did you did, did you learn that as you got older or was that instilled in you by your by your parents or did you learn it through like when you was at rugby and like yeah, other think, peers? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I mean, I, I, I'll be honest with you. So I learned a lot from the psychologist in terms of, like I said, using music as a tool, um, you know, how to focus, how to get over ups and downs. But actually I learned a lot of tools through um, some of the lessons my dad kind of taught me, my whole rugby journey started, you know, out of some failure. I didn't get into the England under 16 side, which when you're 14, you think is the, you know, is the greatest disappointment, especially, yeah. you know, I come from a privileged background. I hadn't I'd had much hardship. Yeah. You know, I'd sort of been um, spoiled to a certain degree. And then when suddenly someone says, actually, no, you're not good enough, where you'd always been good enough, and you look at it and analyze it and go, why was I not good enough? Well, I didn't put the work in. I didn't do the extra training I was supposed to be doing. Yeah. I think the night before one of the trials, me and my mate were in um, Tesco's car park in Bracknell. I drank a six pack and we were fucking around, pushing each other in trolleys, chasing girls. And then I turned up and trained and played like a dickhead. And you know that was my first lesson. I can't play hungover. I can't do that. What, a, what an idiot. But, uh, you know, and and I, what I learned is, is that I think if you, well, his, one of the lessons he always taught me is you can lie to everyone else, but you can't lie to yourself. Nah. And you, if you know, only you know when you put the work in, only you know if you've done what it takes. And a lot of people like to complain about how life hasn't given them this and someone else is default and it's Boris that and it's this that. Listen, at the end of the day, if you've done everything, everything you could possibly do, yeah. whether that's making yourself better, your mind better, your body better, you've reached out for help, you put the extra work in, you've done your research, done everything then blame someone else yeah. if you if any if the answer to the question is i haven't done it in yeah. one of those categories yeah. your life's your fault and yeah. that i learned through through rugby because if i didn't put the work and didn't put the training didn't put the diet didn't put the dedication i didn't get where i wanted to be yeah, and i wasn't good enough or yeah. naturally talented enough to not do that and um that for me was was a, was a big lesson and i learned them throughout my career and it was only when you sort of start doing kind of corporate talks and trying to articulate what was your formula for success? And my success was was working harder than anybody else, but working smarter. So I would I'd identify where I was where I was weak, be able to listen to where you're weak. Because as men, in particular, we're pretty shit at hearing that we're wrong, admitting we're wrong, putting our hand up and saying we're wrong, or being told criticism. Yeah. So it's got to be prepared to listen to that, take that on board. And then I go away and put a game plan in to execute it. So like I, I, if you said I'm shit, go away and work on it, I'd struggle. If you said, listen, you're shit at this, you're good at this, here's how to fix what you're shit at, I'd go away and work on it all day. And every day after training, before training, I would do my extras. i call them extras. Yeah. And it was like 10 to 15 minutes every single day working on every, well, and I would do a different part of my game every week. And that made a massive fucking difference to me. Do you, th do you find, I mean, li listening to your podcast and all that, you, you, you praise, Eddie, Sir yeah. Eddie, like Sir, yeah. Eddie Jones, quite a lot. Do, do you get a lot of, did you learn your most through him? Like, um, you know when you say like, when someone says to you, yeah, you're just, you're shit. Yeah. And then they don't give you any sort of feedback, like where he, he might pinpoint something and you, th you he's playing like psychological yes. warfare with you. Yes. And you know what he's trying to get at. So then if he picks something that you're, you've not done well in a game or in practice or whatever, will you then, You'll know what he's talking about, and you're like, right, I'll concentrate on that. I, I knew what he was talking about, but he'd also have the tools and, and the staff around you to, to, to fix it. Yeah. So, for example, if something wasn't going well, he would turn around and say, "Listen, Hess, mate, you know, it's an Australian accent. Hess, mate, you're not a, you know, this isn't good enough, mate. I need you to go and do this. You need to go and speak to Steve Borthwick. Work on your ball carrying, mate. You're looking a bit fucking slow. I need you off the ground better. I need you tackling better. Yeah. Go away and work on it, and, he, and he'd improve it. The reason I have such an affinity with Eddie." was I was quite an experienced player by the time he took over, yeah. was he just knew how to treat me as a good person and as a respected person and to appreciate that I'm a gobshite, I've got a personality. He knew what you was about, like he did, he did, because you're a bit of, look, you fucking turn up at mine with a fog on, yeah. calling me a ginger piece of shit and like <laughs> abusing all the neighbours yes. and whatever, but it's like he knows that you're a character yes. and you in your world in like the world of rugby uh, let's say sportsmen you need characters yes so he knew not to say has don't do that yeah. don't do that i mean because what i had with other coaches was they would they'd want that side of me but only when it suited them yeah and but, the, but what they could never get their heads around was how i was a joker off the field and enjoying life and doing you know, the naked calendars, the podcast, in the book writing, the yeah. whatever the hell it was I was doing. 
But then as soon as I came and trained, I was the hardest working one in the room. Yeah, yeah. And I was prepared to do it and I was sensible. And because a lot of these old school lads, they couldn't compute it. Eddie just wanted me to be me. From the very first meeting we came in, you know, he was taking, he took the piss. I mean, he, he, you know, he finished his meeting where he, he came in and he was like, now you guys, you know, are your number eight in the world at the moment. Do you really think you're that shit? I'm going to take you to number one in the world, but you're going to have to make some sacrifices. You're going to have to be prepared to go to a place you've never done before. Not all of you are going to make it. It's going to be hard, but it's yeah. going to be fun. And he finished. He goes, anyone got anything to say? And he goes, Hesk. I was like, yeah. He goes, how's your grip strength, mate? I went, what? He goes, how's your grip strength? And I went, I don't know, it seems okay. And he goes, good, mate, because you're fucking clinging on. And everyone was like, <laughs> bah, took the piss and walked out. And everyone was like, fucking hell, he's done you in the first meeting. <laughs> and that was just the way he, he did it. And he would he, he'd come up to me after a good game. He'd like massage my shoulder, go, good Hess, mate, good game. And then the next morning, he'd be like, mate, you're fucking looking tired today. And go and make me a protein shake. The head yeah. coach of England, make me a protein shake. Give it to me and go, mate, you're old. You're old as fuck now, Hess. You need to be taken care of. And like, yeah. it was just, and then he, he'd want my opinion. And he would he would uh, tell me how I could, he basically told me how I could get better. He asked for my opinion. He supported me. He loved me being me. Yeah. He loved all my business uh, stuff off the field. Yeah. And where a lot of the other coaches were intimidated by it. And I, I think he's just a modern manager who understands about the, incog the cognitive well-being of his players. Instead of going, this is my approach, you're all going to have to fit into it. Why? He goes, this is how I'm going to do it. Here's the guidelines. I'm a dictator. This is what I expect. Yeah. But I know I need to treat you yeah. with an arm around you, which was me. I yeah. need to tell you you're a prick. I need to tell you you're this. And he did it all and balanced it out. And then the ability is to make sure that you then put the, the interest of the team first. And if someone is so difficult, yeah. you then fuck them off because yeah. it's not worth it. You yeah. know, like you can have a couple of maverick players, but you can't have a whole team of people that don't pull in the right direction. Who's the biggest maverick you've ever played with then? I'd say I'd say some, I'd say someone that they that is perceived as, as as being difficult is someone like Danny Cipriani. So Danny Cipriani Cip, a, yeah, yeah. was you know he's a fantastic player and a great guy, I, but he was always um, had sort of an individual sportsman's mentality in a team sport. Okay. So he always he knew what he needed, how he did it, and he played phenomenally well. It's but he and I, and I actually think he was always unfairly kind of criticised by. Um, Is it because he was a bit of a pretty boy for rugby? I think I think he was, but also I, I I've, I've said this on record. I think he ended up, you know, he's a good-looking lad, you know. Uh, um, I mean, <laughs> there's so many funny stories. Him and I went to Vegas, and you know, when we were both single, on my best day, I was getting a four out of ten. <laughs> you know, he wasn't even grafting; he was getting tens, and it's like I, you can't argue with that. And but I think he was he was a you know good-looking guy incredibly talented, really, you know, really sweet. But he ended up just shagging a load of wrongings that just sold their stories on him. Yeah. And the thing is, my only criticism of his is, is that, you know, what, look, mate, there's a certain type of bird that's going to do that to you. You get burnt once, yeah. that's fine. Do it a couple of times, fuck me. It's just full, you know, shame on you, innit? It's Maybe like, he didn't want to learn, though. Like, yeah, he, he, he was there for a good time, not a long time. No, well, I, yeah, but I, I think actually, again, I... I disagree. I think he he really was cared about his game, and 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 where what my point was going to be was that actually he he was it an individual sportsman mentality in a team sport, which can mean that you know there's stories about you know not wanting to do the fitness, not wanting to do this because it didn't. It's not because he didn't want to do it. It's because it wasn't right for him yeah, to make him right. But yeah. with a team, you sometimes have to do what you don't want Sacrifice to do for the good of the yeah, team. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't because he didn't care. He and he wanted to be the best he could be, and he used to work so hard um, and I think he was unfairly unfairly pigeonholed because of those things where, you, where it looks like you know people said he was out on the town he never was yeah. it, just because he shagged a couple of wrong ones, who then sold the story yeah. it then creates this narrative that he's there for a good time not a long time and actually it wasn't he was he was really really dedicated yeah. really focused so he was he was good at what he was good yeah at. he was very good at what he was and he was very good at being dead and the problem as a, and, and the, 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 the summation of it is that just in you're in a team you can't turn around in a session and say, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that. No. And that's when you become too difficult to manage. Where is the juice worth the squeeze? Is it worth, um, you know, do you have to manage this guy all the time? And is it one rule for him versus one rule for everyone else? And unfortunately, in a team sport, and I think in a game like rugby that hasn't been that progressive mm -hmm. at times, people just couldn't be bothered to put the time in. Where he's had success and where he's been incredible is where coaches have gone listen this is how Danny is this is what he needs to be done and they've, and they've looked past rightly so the tabloid assumptions that he's out doing so because he never was it's just one wrong one you know shag with Jordan and or one of these other girls and suddenly you're earmarked as this you know renegade lad and it's like he just wasn't like that he was a sweet young kid who wanted yeah. to be the best he could be 
but we've all been like I am. Um, you really didn't have the right coaching around him. I, then. I don't think he had the right coaching. I don't think he had the right. Um, he didn't have the right coaching. I think he didn't have right people looked after him. I think too many people hung him out to dry, um, and I think that's that's unfortunate. And I think he, you know, he still was for a number of years England's best ten. And when he was playing at Gloucester, you know, that year that he played and he won Premiership Player of the Year, won everything. He yeah. was utterly incredible, and he should have gone to the World Cup. Right. But, you know, that is just my view. And the other side of it, again, was he so good? that you could put up with him not necessarily towing the party line within the squad in regards to what he needed as a player, the honest answer is, I don't think he was. And, I, and, I, and I, that is why I think he didn't have the, 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 the success he, he deserved, but he still had a phenomenal career. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, so, yeah, talking about rugby, how much do you miss it? How much do you miss playing? But also, uh, adding on to that, like the way you talk about, like, yeah, again, harping back to your your podcast, the Good, Bad, and the Rugby, with with Tins and Pano. Pano, yeah, Pano. Don't call me Pano. <laughs> um, like the way you guys talk about rugby, and the way you talk about the the old fuckers in the in the game. That the way I listen to it, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong. The way I listen to it is that they're holding the progression of it back. Why are people like you enthusiastic about what you do in everything that you do? Why are people like you not involved in like the like the higher end of yeah. like the England selection team? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I think it's it's um, it's a very hard one because you know would I want to be actively involved? Look, I think there's always people in their life who can pick holes in everything and then don't come up with solutions and just fuck off into the night. I'm not. I never wanted to be one of those people, and and, and I only ever talk from my experience without the the inner knowledge but i would say that from what i've seen in the game you know rugby is not you know it, it never will be ever as big a game as rugby as, as football yeah. it will never be on that stage um, and but you have to appreciate where you're at and we you know we're probably behind cricket in popularity in this country you know if you look at things like social media numbers and notoriety and, and how well people are known yeah um, and you know i think one of our biggest stars you know is marcus smith now He's got 130,000 followers. You know, the biggest cricketers, 1.5 million, 2 yeah. million. Yeah. You know, and that's that's not, not the be all and the end all. But we're in a commercial game. We're in a commercial business, and a lot of the clubs have always gone with this. You know, keep your head down, humble first. We don't want to build up characters. No one's bigger than the team. Talk about all these values. You know, look at you look at England games in the RFU. All these old boys in blazers who've yeah. all been about around there. Who used to play in the in the good old days. They know nothing about marketing. Nothing about commercialism. Nothing about how to grow the game. Grow the game. And we're we're trying to create an entertainment business because that's where the longevity is. Yeah. You know, with everything you've got to compete with now, you need something that's easily digestible, understandable, has big moments, has characters to get behind. Almost a bit like the NFL or NBA models, where you yeah. you know. I mean, you can name, I'm not even watch basketball, but you talk about, you know, Steph Curry, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, Shaq O'Neal, all these kind of guys that you know, uh, they couldn't name one player over here. And, that's, yeah. and that's, the, that's the difference. And I think rugby, it has so many good things about it. It's just, it's held back by these people in positions who don't necessarily have the quali qualification to be there, but they have them there because they used to be a good player and they're a good lad. And that's how we promote from within. And that's what we do. And so I, I'm very vocal about it. But I am not seen as somebody to be listened to by, by them or to be in, involved. You know, I don't, for example, I do know we have the biggest rugby podcast in the world and one of the biggest sports shows in the world. And, the, uh, and we get more viewers or listeners to one episode than you would in any premiership game, even yeah. put them on BT Sport. Yeah. And some, I mean, obviously, when you're at the Six Nations, it's bigger, but some of these games, and not one of us works on mainstream TV or mainstream media now. Why is that? Is that because we're too controversial? Is that because we're not very good at what we do? Is that because no one will listen? Is it? Is it they don't want the like they don't want to upset the apple cart and they don't want so there there are like this goes across the board for all sports. But do you think there's a few people, especially in rugby, that are on a little bit? It's not going to be huge, but are a bit on a of a gravy train. Yes. Oh and yes. They don't want to fucking say something like say say for you get one bod that might say, let's bring Haskell in. Yeah, he might get out of voting and be like, no, yeah, no, yeah. no he, he, well, we've got to get this cut. Yeah, 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 of course. Uh, that, that, there, there is a lot of the same kind of people that have been around for a long time who um, are in that, you know, who were that same people. Clive Woodwards, when it was on Sky, yeah. still writing for the Daily Mail. You know, he hasn't been enrolled in rugby really since 2005, six. You know, we're in 2022 now. 
Um, you know, you've seen the, the TV pundits. You know, the other problem with the rug, uh, rugby coverage is that it's there's not one unified channel. Bit yeah. on Amazon, bit on Sky, bit yeah. on BBC, bit on ITV, bit on Channel Four, yeah. and no one knows where to go to get their games. Look, no. someone's on BT Sport. Nobody has BT Sport. It's it's very hard, um, and I think look, I think what they go for is safe, dependable stars. So you know, you have guys that have done achieve way more than me in the game, but maybe not that. I don't know, engaging or stuff, but I've seen as better. So when they're wheeled out on TV, they're, they're seen as great. I'll tell you someone I thought was brilliant was a guy called Dylan Hartley, former teammate of yeah, mine. Yeah, I've heard the, part, heard the episode. Yeah. yeah, he was great, and he, you know, he did the, um, you know, he was doing a lot of the, the, the BBC stuff. And again, yeah. they've changed him. Also, with these broadcasts and mainstream broadcasters, because the world for a long time was unbalanced in terms of demographics represented on TV, and yeah. also. Uh, where a society where these people are coming from and also male or female yeah. they're now gone so far the other way they're tripping over themselves to 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 f to be seen to be doing the right thing and it, they're not necessarily picking the people that have got the best knowledge to say they're picking the people that they think make themselves look good on tv it's like a know? box ticking exercise but, but, but then i think but the, the the one thing with that is if you've got um say for example um a young woman right who isn't necessarily represented on tv yeah um, who basically uh, hasn't got a, um, a representative on TV and she's at university and goes, where can I reach? Where, where's the glass ceiling I can reach? And they've got no one to look up to, yeah. then you lose it. So if you go and employ now, for example, a lot of women yeah. in a job, in five, six years time, potentially, you will then have the very best because they will see a pathway. It's sure. the same with different demographics. You know, if they've not represented on TV, yeah. where do they see that they can been Cross aspirational yeah, yeah, where can they yeah. possibly get to you know so it might not be the best people now so I see it on the other side but what they will have is a lot of um, use a uh, use of different different apps being able to then be represented and see wow that presenters on that show yeah. that I never thought I could do that so I do understand then both they could of it. choose a different career path and That's follow I mean. in that footstep and they suddenly feel like they, they get the doors open to them because it has been so unbalanced and because we have not represented ourselves but I would just say we, we we are now going the other way, where they're not the best people necessarily get the job, and it's hard when, you know, someone like myself is not what necessarily you want to be seen on on TV. So I I, I see it from both sides, but it, I, I would say that we try to have an impact where we can to help develop the game, and we are creating conversations. And I never want to be negative for the sake of it. I just think my experiences of it is we could just do so much more. We could learn from other sports, and we sort of think we're doing well when we're actually not. It's like look at look at when like winning the Rugby World Cup like there should have been a massive I don't know fucking billboards everywhere yeah. TV commercials I don't know yeah. like fucking I don't know deodorant commercials bit being pushed out to like like I don't know he probably didn't no, want to do it but Johnny Wilkinson or whatever that's the problem so I was about to say so jo Johnny Wilkinson was and could have been the biggest I mean he, look he, he was the Beckham of well. rugby he, he was but unfortunately through his own desire and mental health issues that he's been very vocal about. Yep. He turned everything down, yep. turned all it down, didn't want to do it, didn't want to say, you know, I, I've said this many times. If I had had his looks and his talent, I would have been fucking hanging out with Brad Pitt. <laughs> there would have been action figures, billboards. I'd be fucking with Beckham all the time. You never would have seen it like it. I would have been doing everything with everyone. You would have been him. on the I'm, Avengers, you fuck. Oh, my, you? that's what I mean. Yeah. I would have been out hanging out with Tony Stark. I would have been <laughs> everywhere. But. All he wanted to do was carry on playing rugby and he didn't really enjoy it. And, he, and they missed the marketing opportunity of a lifetime. Now, he's, he's a World Cup winner. That's probably why everyone loves him and everyone thinks I'm a prick. And he's, you know, and he's got a load of money in the bank. I would have done things very differently. Now, the is that, but, is that, but, but is that through shit management of him? Like in encouragement? Uh, yes, I, but I also think he was very unique because he was good looking or is good looking, was incredibly talented, very dedicated, but riddled with self-confidence issues, mental health issues, didn't want to, you know, really be in the spotlight, didn't want to put himself out there. Yeah, yeah. But I would also say that for the rest of the players, there were some good bits that they marketed, but unfortunately, because having personalities, having characters, utilizing them, getting them on TV, the marketing and infrastructure in rugby is pretty gash. You know, they didn't really know, you know, gash. if you look at the, <laughs> such a good word, isn't it? <laughs> if you look at the, if you look at the, the social media, um, you know, there's probably only a couple of clubs that are really kind of progressive, edgy with their social media. Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes the campaigns I've done in rugby, they think, wow, this campaign's amazing. And you just look at it and go, this is utter garbage yeah, in comparison yeah. to something that another sport would do. So even the guys in 2003 that did milk the fuck out of it, yeah. 
weren't really utilised as much as they could have been. And, and, and because, again, rugby is a bit of a, you know, I think it, it, it's more diverse than you would be led to believe, but it's still a bit of a public school, hoity-toity yeah. way of doing things. La-dee-da. Not at, la-dee-da, yeah. not at club rugby level, actually, because it's much more a mixture. Okay, yeah. But it is seen as, you know, if I don't come from the right school, will I get into it? And then when you're trying to market it, you've got those people, again, making them decisions where, yeah. you know, 2003 could have been, um, or, you know, and was for a period of time, a, a real seminal moment that made us the, the biggest sport in the country. Yeah. Because England, football haven't, you know, we got, got to, what was it, Euro final. That's the best, you know, since 66, it's the yeah. best we've ever done. Yeah. And, you know, every time it's coming home. But we know characters, you know, you know your Harry Canes, you know your, you know, um, I can't think of the fucking other lads, but you know, Foden, you know, all these other people from um, from the England side, you know, and we all know who they are, but yeah. actually, um, you know, uh, um, Pickford and stuff, you know those guys, but actually rugby again, uh, they'd struggle to do it, and a lot of average people in the street, when you ask about rugby, they say, oh, uh, I know the ones who do the dance, the ones in the black. They, Someone would uh, just say Jonah Loma. Yeah, so I mean, Jonah Loma, but yeah. look at what he did for the sport. Yeah. Jonah Loma, they say Jonah Loma, or the guys that do the dance. What, you mean the All Blacks? Yeah. Oh, yeah, the All Blacks. They don't even know their own England side. Nah. So nah. we've got so much to do to raise awareness. And we know we don't play it in a lot of schools. Do, so you, we think, do you think, like, uh, 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 let's say grassroots and all that, do you think a lot of, a lot of clubs or, or, let's say, universities, colleges, are scared to take the jump like to make like you talk about like social media side of things at like Premier League clubs and that yeah. it's like some have got it all right some have like fucking are just shit do you reckon they just they just don't want to go down the path they got their fucking little their little avenue and it's like we're happy with what we're doing we're, we're making a little bit of money we might get the odd bod that makes it through and then ends up representing England and then onto the British and Irish Lions and we can say oh yeah we come to our fuck he went to our school like they don't want to take it that step further. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think clubs are scared to take the leap. I just think that a lot of kids at school don't play sport anymore. Um, hence, we've got an obesity epidemic and everyone's stuck on their phones and most of the government has sold the training fields away. You're, back, you're big on the old fat fighter stuff, aren't you? I, because, I mean, look, I, I, I say this the other day, I was going to do a video on my Instagram about it. I went into the... Um, you know, the vaccination uh, place gets booster because I can't get into France getting a booster. I had my two jabs and I was like, I'm happy with that. I had COVID twice, I'm done. Yeah. And this fucking rule that you now get a boost is bollocks. It's like, right, I've got, I've had it. What, there's absolutely no need. You know, it doesn't stop you getting it. It doesn't stop you spreading it. It's just pointless. It just means it's less, less, you know, A, less kind of um, aggressively um, kind of transmittable, but also, it, you know, it, it lessens the thing for you. That's it. But yeah. the rest of it, I fucking can't be bothered with it. Yeah. So I was in there and I was looking at all these people tripping over themselves to get boosters. And I was thinking, you're so eager to stick a jab in your arm, but that, but 90% of them were overweight. Yeah. And I was like, what? Do you know that you're going to get way worse repercussions from anything COVID is ever going to do to you um, by being obese, you know, by being overweight? You're going to have back problems, uh, feet problems, lung problems, heart problems, uh, you know, probably get diabetes, all these other stuff that you're doing, yet... Someone says you use a free thing, you put a jab, but you won't take care of yourself. And Fucking it's, Dr. Phil in the back here, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but it's not, it's not, but again, I, I know what people forget as well, if you get morbidly obese or over a certain weight, it's a mental yeah. health issue as much as it is a physical issue. But I think, you know, the education around all that stuff at schools for kids and explaining what a calorie is, how it works, not taking your advice off reality star or on no, fucking no. on the internet, not listening to your doctor that believes, you know, the food's still based on the food pyramid and stuff. It's like, fuck's sake. It's, you know, and, and just all this, you know, low sugar that, low sugar that. Unless you've got a decent diet, fucking sugar that make a difference to what yeah. you're doing. And just all these stupid diet, you know, like Slimming World, like talking about sins and sin this and sin that, when actually, you know, just understanding calories and how you put it into your body would be a great starting point. Teaching kids how to cook and what that means. I, I'd, that would be such a valuable lesson over some of the shit I learned at school that I've never used. Yeah. Never used. And I know it's up the point of learning is to show that you can learn and stay dedicated, but most stuff are done for you now. I just, you just don't need to learn it. You might as well learn practical life lessons like how to do a fucking tax return, how to fill out a passport. Mortgages and all that. Mor- how yeah. to do a mortgage. How to, all the stuff that you actually need as an adult. Yeah. You're not taught. So uh, anyway, but that's just a, a distraction. But so I yeah, think, going back to rugby. You're going back to rugby. But I think, I think with the, the stuff around um, and the, the playing stuff at school, it's not that they won't take the leap. It's as I said, it's because again, it's a limited sport. It's there's concern about um, you know concussion now, which is a real issue. I think rugby needs to be a summer sport because nobody wants to get tackled in the mud and rain. A lot of people's experiences of rugby are 
the meathead rugby team at university, pissing out of the wall, being sick on each other, you know, doing all dressed like dickheads, uh, or, you know, little kids getting fucking flattened by people and never wanting to do it again. I think there's so much more you could do teaching touch rugby and the, f the fun of just having a ball in your hand, mixed touch, boys and girls doing that, the tag rugby. Making yeah, like, it, like, like flag rugby, you know, yes. like flag on your yeah. shorts and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, make, and make um make rugby a summer sport. So, you know, we're playing in the sunshine. Yeah, the pitch will be a bit, a bit harder, but fucking grow up, you know, life's hard. Do you know what I mean? So Get cut, you little fuck. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it's also, there, all these people always complain, oh, it's easy for you as a premiership player, when you're a premiership player, you think about the kids at grassroots. It's like, trust me, they're going to want a much more play on a field, which is a slightly slightly harder than running in the mug, freezing, stones yeah, and all that. freezing in the fucking cold. Parents hate it. Then you get booted in the face when you try to make a tackle. You never want to do it again. That, but they just don't understand because they all live their youth on like rugby with a bit of rain. It's like, fuck off, you old fuck. You don't know what you're talking about. Do you... Sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's, that's the joy of that. Yeah. Do you find that, obviously you do with rugby, but do you find society in general has just become one big massive fucking minge fest? Yes. I mean, I, I, yeah, look, again, you have to be very careful because for so much of the time, things were unbalanced. We talked about the demographic stuff. You know, and even like... You know, people talk about the, the, the issue with, with, with race, for example. We obviously have still a massive inherent racist problem within yep. society, yep. right? And, and, and until people understand that you're not, you know, you don't, you're not born a racist, you're made a racist by people around you and the thought process, and that there is a real still an imbalance, and we have to go, we have to do more yep. to make it much more understandable and do much more. And that's why it's such an important conversation that can't be forgotten. But I think, and that goes across the board for all the other stuff. We have had things wrong for such a long time. Even stuff about men not speaking up, you know, like it, men are awful at sharing their problems, awful at communicating, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What people are forgetting now, and what the other, so one side say that we're not speaking enough, the other side go, well, you never solved anything by just talking. No, no. You fucking got to match talk with change, otherwise it's pointless. Just crying in a corner and saying, oh, I've, this has happened to me, and not matching it with any change, you're never going to fix it. Nah. And I think we. We, are, we have gone a bit soft around certain things because, you know... You we know, are, like we, rewarding medals for a fifth yes, place that's, I'm not, Yeah, that's, no, no, it's all that bollocks, right? Yeah. You know, because what, it, what, it, what all that teaches you is that life's equal when it's not, yeah. that life can be successful for everyone, which it can't be, and that, you know, it takes away from the fact that it, to be successful, it takes a lot of graft, a lot of hard work, going, being uncomfortable, being, learning to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, resilience, getting the fuck up every time someone calls you a prick, that yeah. people will tell you you're shit, that you know, you're gonna have the best thing in the world, and, and someone you come don't, You don't learn otherwise, do you? you? Don't. Like, that, you've got to have disappointment. But what, you've got to, what, what we're getting away from is that we're asking people to talk about stuff, and, and we're trying to accommodate everybody, yeah. and that's where you can't do that. Yeah. And what you've got to remember that, and this is slightly profound, and this is only my belief, and Snows is gonna stir up a load of shit, but, even the stuff around gender and everything else is... Go on. Go on. No, no, I'm going to say, he's, he's going to say that you... Everybody's going through life and experiencing something differently, right? It's called the human experience. It's, it's the journey we have from life to death. Now, some people have a short one, some people have a long one. We're all going through it, right? And it's the same thing. And Dave Chappelle, the comedian, did, a, did an amazing um, show um, on Netflix that they tried to get him cancelled for. And, and actually, yeah. fair play to Netflix. They said... We're not taking it down. There will be content on our channels, as there is in lo certain libraries and most libraries, that will cause offence to somebody. Scroll we past can, it. Yeah, we can't. We cannot go uh, at the speed of the slowest man in life, and we cannot accommodate everyone. And there's nothing wrong with getting offended. But what we have to remember is that it's each of our. Uh, we're each having a human experience. So, for example, the gender topic is is becoming so toxic because. People feel like they haven't been represented, and what they're doing when they're not feeling represented is they're trying to fucking cancel and treat other people with how they've been treated, and that is not going to solve anything. No. And it's the same thing with, you know, and Dave Chappelle talks very, you know, very aptly about kind of transphobia versus race, saying, and again, these are two topics I know nothing about, and I'm only going on what he says, but saying that, you know, he uh, said he looks at the LGBT plus community going, fucking hell, we need your PR. You know, we've had we've had hundreds and thousands of years of slavery and and, and, and you know still treated like fuck. We're still getting shot by police in America. We're still yeah. having all this stuff. And you know, you guys have done relatively fucking well. You yeah. know, you've got it's it's now acceptable to be gay. It's now acceptable to be whatever it is. And uh, but I just think trying to cancel people, trying to cancel him in such an aggressive way, yeah. is not going to fix anything. And yeah. I just think people need to understand that they see life through the, only their eyes, and that you you have you cannot appreciate 
that we can't, we, sorry, you have to appreciate that not everyone sees it as you, yeah. and that if you don't like something, you just move on. That you ask for acceptance, you try to treat people nicely, but you don't try and burn the person's house down or take their livelihood away if they don't understand you. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. As, and as I said, it, it's, um, it's very hard that process because I, you know, my brother's gay. I'm very kind of uh, very open about all this kind of stuff and, yeah. and gender stuff. I, what I find hard is, is that I don't believe that you can feel you can feel like you're nothing, and I don't believe that you can also, um, you know, get upset if someone doesn't understand what you're going through. Yeah, it's yeah. like I, I, once you've educated, and go actually, wow, I didn't know that. Okay, I will do whatever you require me to do. Yeah. But if I don't get it right, or I say something that I believe or that, that that is backed up by science and and sort of things that we've we've learned through history that give us our identities and our kind of things that we hold society on. Yeah. In 2022, we're asking everyone to tear all that up and go, we're not going to go against science, go against years and years of what we believed was correct. Yeah. It's going to take, and I'm not saying that's not the right way of doing it. I'm just going to say it's, take, it's going to take us a long time to fucking get it right. And I, I just think that comes down to all of this stuff is that we're all just experiencing life and we just all need to take a minute. And this whole cancel culture and taking offense and you know, trying to end people, it's just, it's never going to work. It's just going to cause more and more and more problems. divide, isn't it? It causes yeah. more divide and it, and it, and it, and I just think, like I said, you know, the, 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 it hasn't become softer. Well, it has, it has become softer. We've just become, we just want everyone to feel okay and acceptable. And life is not like that. Like the re and the way you look at life and understand it, it's very simple. The division of wealth, intelligence, physical ability, mental ability, um, you know, where you're born, it's just not, it's not even, you know, Ricky Gervais nah. says, you know, how good is it, you know, or how unfortunate is it that, well, we're, how fortunate it is that you, we're born in a Christian country or a Catholic country, so we're going to go to heaven. Imagine how bad it is for all the Japanese who are born there who are immediately going to go to hell. So yeah. you're telling me that if there was a higher power, which I don't believe, you, you are telling me that, that, that he would let a whole section of society be condemned to hell by the very point where they're born. It's just utter bollocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's the same thing with, you know, trying to make everybody, you should always help those who are less fortunate than you, yours, and it's, and it's part of society. But I equally can't go at the pace the slowest, you can't fix everyone's problems. Not everyone deserves to fucking have everything. And that's how hard, and that's the shitness of life. And what we're trying to do is pretend that it's not like that. Yeah. And we're trying to pretend that everyone can have everything and we're all oh good. And do you know what? It's just about taking part. Is it fuck? Yeah. No one got anywhere or being successful by just being given anything or being work or not working hard or making sacrifice. That's for me is the hardest thing and why we've gone soft. Because it's teaching people that if they go, oh, I don't like it, then they're going to get what they want. And it's like in the real, real world, yeah. you, you don't get that. I mean, now I, I don't envy someone who owns a business I'm trying to fire someone it's fucking a nightmare. You've got yeah. to go through four or five different processes, and even then, you have to be very careful they don't get you for unfair dismissal. Yeah. Whereas I quite like the rugby world, we were like, you're shit, you're told you're shit, you're dropped, there's nothing you can fucking do about it. If you're a cunt, we all tell you you're a cunt. <laughs> we, we watch a video and say, and, and we watch a review every Monday, point out everyone's mistakes, give you the tools to go away and work on it, and then you go and do it. And you know, and if you don't win, and you don't perform, you don't get anywhere. Yeah, Whereas it's, it's, you know. it's like kids and babies. It's like my, my boy. If he if he uh, if he asks for a like a bottle of water or something, he doesn't say please. I put him in the fucking shed. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm not having I'm not having any of that. No, but because I think as well. Early. I think as well. Man, like I had a big thing when I did. I'm a celebrity. Where I, I kept insist like Kate Garraway. Obviously, she had a hell of a time with her, unfortunately with her husband. But mm. you know during that period of time, she kept saying, you know, you go first, you go first, you're bigger, you know, and I, and I was like, no, 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 look, ladies go first, like, it's just the rule. Well, you know, and I said, look, can we just cut the shit? Yeah. Every day we have to have the same conversation. There's five women, you all go first. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then I was told, actually, chivalry is not um, letting women, or telling women to go first, it's letting them decide. And I was like, fuck's sake, oh, I can't, fuck you know, boring, and if you it? want to open a door and you open the door, I don't need a man to open the door, all right, well, I, I don't. I, you know, I well, just what I've been taught. Yeah, that's what I mean. But it's just what I've been I've been taught, and it's like, it's you know. But then again, then I then I always laugh, and there's that thing where you know fe when the feminism disappears, when it's time to pay for the bill. You know, it's like, but I, I I'm very tongue in facetious because that's just a meme that I saw. But it, it's like it's fucking true though. It, well, some but then uh, but then I, I the best thing about Chloe is that she you know she pays for half of everything. Is, is successful, works hard, and I don't. I have again. I'm about to have a a, a little girl. I don't I wouldn't buy my daughter a mop and bucket set and my son a fucking calculator and a suit I would let them the sky they those gender roles do whatever you want to yeah, do yeah um, but I think we, we're getting ourselves so bogged down where like 
What's wrong with me opening a door? What's wrong with me offering to pay on the first date? What's wrong with a girl offering to pay? It doesn't, none of this stuff matters, but it, it's become such a fucking, um, a load of drama. And, it, and I, I, it's Because it, it, you then, then start going down the fucking rabbit hole. It's like, where does it end? That's what I mean. Where does it end? Because well, we, we had these kind of things. And like, for example, you know, I see it all the time with Chloe and how people treat her in front of me, that except sexism is alive and real. And that, um, it needs to be, you know, you need to, to, to look at it because, you know, sometimes men will just ignore her, talk to me, she'll say the same, she'll say an answer, I'll say the same thing, and I, or, or someone will say the same thing, but my wife just said that. And they, yeah. they only look at her to see if she's fit, and then they carry on and like, you I've know, seen you bend over on your Instagram, love. Yeah, that's what I mean. And just stuff on like, stuff on, you know, in businesses, you know, it has been unfair for a long time, and we've, yeah. got, we've got to put it, put it right. But also, we still have to understand that I've been brought up in a certain way, and that, you know, if you need to tell me that, okay, perhaps letting women go first is insulting them, then I, you know, I'll do that. But like, I remember Kate kept saying, oh, you know, I slept on the floor because there wasn't a bed for me. And she kept saying, you know, you're too big, you sleep, you know, I'll, I'll sleep on the floor. I was like, Kate, I'm not throwing a woman out of a bed. Like, nah. I just wouldn't do it. I'd rather not do it. But yeah. like, like what you say, it's when it suits certain people yeah. in certain situations. It's like, if, if I don't think you should neglect your the way you was brought up with regards to how you treat women like yeah. you are full-blooded like heterosexual male let it it's manners ladies yeah. first open the door fucking yeah. open it uh, pull out a chair for us yeah, to sit yeah, down. Yeah, yeah. because i mean i was just going to get onto this and like and say congratulations to you and chloe about, about to have a little girl it's like you want your little girl when she grows older you want her to be treated like a fucking princess yes. you know what i mean yeah. you would like her husband a future husband to pull out a chair or yeah. someone's going to like fucking listen to this and say well I just, why can't you be with a woman yeah I just yeah I just want to I want to I want to like because Chloe's taught me a lot about kind of being compassionate and, and actually shedding a light on the stuff of how it is unbalanced a lot and how you know women aren't treated as well as they should be and that you can understand why they why there is this outcry to do things the other way and I want my daughter to be like her. I want her to be strong, independent, where the, where the sky is the limit, where she can do whatever she wants to be, whatever, who, be with whoever she wants to be, and whatever else. Yeah. But I also want her to have an expectation that there are certain boundaries that men should adhere to, that they should they should be polite, they should be thing, and she should be polite and back, and that she should, you know, earn money and do whatever she should do. And like I think, you know, because. We had the old thing where you get married and your missus doesn't work. All that old, it's like, fuck yeah. off. It's like, I want my missus to be 10 times more successful than me. I, I want her to do whatever she wants to do. And like, a lot of men can't handle having a powerful woman because it, shed, it sheds a light yeah. on them. I fucking, fuck that. I want her to be- You'd whatever. rather sit home with your feet up I doing your I decks, wouldn't you? I would be a kept yeah. man. I don't, I don't care about it. My dignity and stuff is not in, in my uh, pride. It's not wrapped up in stuff like that. And I think, you know, and I think unfortunately, with the social media, with all the advents of smartphones, I, 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 listening to a lot of people, all the kind of, you know, there's a lot of kind of aggression to, going towards women, and even just, you know, without getting even more deep than we are going, like things around the sexual stuff, you know, like men watching tons of porn and thinking the expectation of women is that is how you're supposed to behave. And you see, I mean, I mean apparently we're, um, like the, 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 the figures in terms of like violent crimes or, vi or, or abuse, it's just gone through the roof because we're losing right. boundaries. Yeah. And actually I think, some fucking chivalry and some actual manners and stuff and understanding boundaries and parents bringing them up to go listen you know this is how you respect a woman this is what how a woman respects a man yeah. these are what we, you should do i think would be would be a good way, place to start to re put somebody's balance in it it doesn't it's not inhibiting it doesn't stop them being anything they want to do it just says look you know son if you you know this is you don't lay a hand on a woman you're a gentleman this is what you do this is how you do it you know, daughter, listen, you're not, you don't, if a man ever tells you to fucking, you're a second citizen or doesn't look in the eye, you tell him to fuck off. Yeah. You know, if they say, do you can't have a job, you tell him to fuck off. I, I want to have that balance. I want her to be, you know, I, and the reason I wanted a daughter is I wanted to kind of um, sh sort of round off some of the sharp edges I have. Because, yeah. mate, I'm, you know, I, I, I've probably been quite misogynist in the past, not intentionally, but I went to an all-boys boarding school. I went to an all-boys all prep school, all-boys boarding school, and I was surrounded by 40 men for 19 and a half seasons. A there's lot of lot, alphas there, aren't there? there? There is not a lot of uh, female, th I don't have many female friends. No. You know, a boarding school, I think, you know, I didn't go to a mixed school until the last two years. Only time you ever saw women was an object of, you know, trying to date or a sexual object. There wasn't any of that kind of, um, interaction and I wouldn't do that to my children now because yeah. I don't I think and why a lot of these you know these toffs and people who go to Twickenham and barbers and these and a lot of these people that's the exposure they had they don't understand women a lot of them you know they don't they don't they don't have that kind of exposure and yeah. so I wanted a daughter because a 
I think it'll make me a better person. B, hopefully she'll come out like Chloe, and and you know, and she'll be, but she'll be. I want her to be, you know, st- you know, strong, and she kick fuck out of a bloke, but also, you know, into Disney and everything else. Like yeah. I, 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 Mike Tyndall's daughter, Mia, is actually very, um, very like that kind of. She's quite a sweet girl, but she's like, you know, she'll. T- <laughs> She like goes and plays uh, rugby with the lads, like cuts them in half. You know, one of her cousins pushed her over, and she was like miser on the floor. And I was like, Mia, just shut up and go and <laughs> go and get her. And she just ran and like, tackled her from behind, having a like a like a light hat, not punch but like a scrap, like try to choke each other out, put yeah. me in arm bar. It was like, I was like, fair play, but because you want a rough and tumble kid, I think again, we 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 put these expectations that. You know, I mean, if my girl wanted daughter wanted to be a cat, I mean, I doubt with my look she's going to be anything but a professional wrestler or a cage fighter. But I, you know, I'm mean, great. I don't, I think. But if she wants to be a ballerina or she wants to do whatever, she can do whatever she wants. Or she wants to be a bad, badass lawyer because I think, and I'm a bit ranting, but the, it's interesting when a man comes into an office, and this is what I saw interviewing some of the people for my other podcast, What a Blanca. You know, you have women going into workplaces. There, isn't it? Yeah, 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 a bit of a plug, sorry. And um, you had these women going into his workplaces, and they were like, right, I want to embrace my sex, uh, sex, um, sex, sexualism, like I want to be, you know, uh, and express myself, but I don't want to be seen as not professional. I want to be able to be strong, but I don't want to be seen as a bossy bitch. I don't, and it's like all of that's going through their heads. Whereas I just walk into a room and I go, I am what I am. This and is I think, what I am, yeah. Yeah, and I think men have that, don't have that sort of thought process. And I said to her, look, it, the, uh, it was Natalie Pinkham I was interviewing. And we were talking about all these kind of points. And it was amazing how, you know, you want to sort of embrace your femininity, but then you don't want to be because you know a strong-willed woman. A lot of men go, oh, "Fucking hell, she's a ball breaker." You never say a, you never say a bloke's a fucking too tough, do you? you go, "Fucking hell, he's a, you know he's a good boy." Yeah. It's it's again, we need to get past all of that. So and, and I think. But then if we if we do and then everyone sort of accepts X one, there'd be no debate. There'd be nothing to fucking talk about. Uh, I know. <laughs> I know. And but that's that's the you know that's the idea that wherever people are trying to again, I said it comes back full circle to making everyone equal, to iron out all the wrinkles and to forget that we're all individuals, we all see things very differently. And I think there should be a general consensus, like, you know, general consensus, oh, communism bad, Nazis bad, child abuse is bad. And in the middle, let's just let everyone else get on to whatever they're, you know, yeah. whatever they want to be and how they want to do it. You know, I saw something Joe Rogan posted that, you know, he said that men can have children. And he's like, you might think it's impossible, but if you change what demographic, uh, what your understanding of a man is, then you have, but it's like, no, a man transitioning to a woman can, is no less a, a woman because she can have kids. You know what I mean? It's, it's complicated. Like people, it's, it's, it's the extremes. Yeah. And I think society's now got into extremes. And it's like, I know nothing about these topics. I'm a white middle class fucking guy who's not had any of this stuff. All I can see is just, it just feels like common sense and feels like it's understanding. But it's actually, it's not my journey. It's just, what I see, and I think it's the pitfalls, and the reason I even mention it on here is because in broadcasting and stuff, it's like, you know, one of the mistakes of one of these things, and you'll you will never you never work again, really. No, 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 no. So, pregnancy and all that, and got a girl on the way, have you got names? How far gone is Chloe? What's going um, so on? So she's 16 weeks. Yep. Um, I, can't, <laughs> I can't go into too much detail because I've signed a deal with OK. Because, uh, you Have know, you? of course, mate, because I don't fucking, the ginger cabbie don't pay for a fucking little tour around the town, does he? I, you know, I'm <laughs> going to make that bread, otherwise, you know, what am I going to be, can't put fuel in the range, can't put goodwill in the fucking Range Rover, can you? Well, so, I'll tell you what, St- St- Steph's out taking some money for herself then, because I've, I've given her I've given her some cash, so you want to fucking Oh, have, really? No, no, no I was about to say, I'm taking yet. lunch off you, <laughs> and, I, and I haven't eaten for a couple of days, so I'm going to fucking hammer it. Um, oh. But no, so that, yeah, I'm excited about it. I mean, she's 16, she's 16 weeks. Cool. Obviously, a little girl. Names we, we're sort of working on. Because the thing is, every time you talk about names, everyone knows there was a prick called by that name. Yeah. So every time you say it, people go, oh, we can't do that. So and so's called their kid. I was like, well, first of all, I want to call it fucking Megatron. I will. I mean, I don't think that's I think a great it's name, though. Great name for a little girl. <laughs> you know, some guy tried to do that, and they, um, I think they, they, they called his kid Megatron, and they, they like, child services got involved. Because I think, like, I think there is, I know you can call your kid anything, like, you know, um, Elon Musk called it X, P, Y, O, P, whatever the fuck it's called. I think there is a certain limit to how much of a dickhead you could be, like, you yeah. know. Um, that's just untold amount of money, though, isn't it? Do what you want. Un- yeah, that's untold. Or you want your kid to be fucking bullied. Yeah, that's what I mean. Again, parents just don't really consider it. They're like, well, we, we hope they won't get bullied. Well, you've called it, I mean, Tar- that's the thing. Tarquin. If, Tarquin, if I call my kid Petal, and she turns out to be a six foot one <laughs> wrestler, 
you know, with a biker girlfriend. I don't think going, oh God, here comes Petal Haskell. It's going to be a good, I'm we're sort of setting her up for a fall. Just if I had a son. I mean, my, my mate is called his kid. Yeah. Apollo Fox, right? A fucking unbelievable, Apollo Fox. And like, oh, like both God. the parents are very, like super attractive. His dad's a massive character. They, but Apollo Fox, like, it's good. It's setting out. It's got to be, you've got to be a fuck. You've got to have something about you to be called Apollo Fox. Yeah. So I just got to be very careful because I'm obviously a bit of a prick. Perceive, people perceive me as that already. My kid's already going to be on the back foot. I just need to make sure that I just do justice by her and that she's cute and sweet and that she does. I don't give her any more. Just call her Johnetta. 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 I mean, yeah, because Chloe like does like boys' names for girls. So I was yeah. like, what, like Terry? John. John. Terry. Just yeah. John. Yeah, not John Terry. Fuck that. No, <laughs> no, no. Jesus Christ. No, John or Terry, not John Terry. Yeah. Terry's nice with an eye. Yeah. Oh yeah, forgot that. Yeah. I want like Nigel. Nigel for, Nigel with a Y. <laughs> N- N- Nigele. Nigele. Yeah. Top oh, man. Listen, Hask, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. Let's hope we didn't get cancelled. No, no, we de- we definitely won't. I've got a little bit of a treat for you. Have you? Yeah, it's a, su- it's a surprise. So uh All right, bear with in. me for five minutes. I will. Top oh, man. It's not you in a thong, is it? So much to Haskell's disappointment, I wasn't going to show him my selection of thongs. However, I took him to one of Essex's finest cryo wellness centres. I was acting a bit of a goat flexing next to him, because he is a bit of a unit of a man. And he knows being a sportsman, what it means to have mental and physical rehabilitation. So what we've done, we've got him into an ice chamber. We've got him in there at a minus 140 degrees. Let's see how he gets on with it. Look at him, man mountain of a man. Triceps, biceps, pecs and abs. And here comes the water buffalo, standing next to the man I wish I could be. Look at the state of him. Pale in skin tone next to James, although he does look like he's got a bit of jaundice, the man. And here's the man that knows, old Stevie Reynolds, Mr. Side Party. He knows what he's talking about. He loves it. Very passionate about what he does. I was actually concerned for Haskell at this point because I thought he was going to be too big for the chamber. And as you can see, he struggles with getting his arms out. Or maybe it's because he didn't want to scratch his new baby tattoo that he's got on his forearm. Being an international DJ, this is all part of the rehabilitation process, especially if you're going out to Uncle Wayno in Ocean Beach. And here he comes, look at him, the Hulk, chiseled in all the right places. And now it's the water buffalo's turn. A little tap on the bum for good luck, and on we trot. The reason why I find this treatment helpful is due to my job being a black cab driver, I suffer with all kinds of aches and pains. Can you imagine all those Uber drivers? When getting out of the chamber, I must admit your world feels a little bit weird. Your equilibrium is all over the place. But after a few moments, you feel brand new. And there it is, a little hug, and I didn't want to let go. But yes, after this, I must say we were both feeling prim and proper. And even Haskell suffers from a really bad old ankle injury. He actually come out of there, running down the street, and he was very, very impressed with Essex Cryo Wellness. Up the Johns. Bosh! Right, Mr. Haskell. Hask. Yes. I've got some quick fire questions for you. Fine. So, some of the like, bit of yes, no, whatever. Fine. The clue's in the fucking title. Yeah, I got that. I'm not on a slow readers group. Deep joy. I've got a bit of this from your uh, from your Good, Bad and Rugby podcast. Of course you did. Gave a bit of an idea. Oi, plagiarism's a form of flattery, isn't it? Bit of an idea. Right, so what was bigger bollocks? Brexit or COVID? I'd say COVID is the bigger bollocks. Right, what's your favourite word? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, What is my favourite word? Well, I quite like cunt if I wanted to do it. Name a place in the world that you visited that you think is overrated. Oh, 
That is a great question. Where is fucking overrated? I'd say, I find Berlin slightly yep. over, overrated, but I was there filming Ampert for Volkswagen. I didn't really get to see as much as I would want, and my friends really recommend it, but I'd say Ber yeah, Berlin. Uh, right. Have you ever wanted to punch Martin Johnson? Um, have I ever, no, I've never wanted to punch Martin Johnson because um, he's just a legend of a game. Do you know what I mean? Like some of the I've rolled my eyes at, yeah. but not um, no, no. I would never do that. I too respect him too much. Uh, anywhere in the world you would love to DJ? Yes, um, I want to DJ in Tomorrowland in Belgium. Would be amazing. I've been there a couple of times. It's um, something like twelve stages, hundred thousand people, and, and it's, oh, uh, it's put together in a town called Boom yep. in Belgium. What a perfect name for it! And I went there, and it just goes off. In the whole wide world, who's your favourite person? Oh, well, apart from my wife, obviously. Um, who's my favourite person? Um, that you look at, like, you know when the person calls your phone, gets oh, a text say, message? I'd, or... I'd say my best mate, Paul Doran Jones. Yeah? I'd say, yeah. I always, I speak to the same two, I speak to the same three people every day. I speak to my mate, Jamie, who yeah. I would say is a close second. I speak to Dozza and I speak to my missus. I just call, I check in with those two as well. But I think Dozza, every time I see him, I have a laugh. Like, yeah. like you know. Right. Um, here we go. This is one. Would you rather... Because just to put context on this, you bought a dog through COVID, didn't you? Yes. And the dog is, uh, I see, is, is on your socials quite a lot. And yes. you love your dog. Yes. Trained it very well, I've, I will add. Thank well you. Done. Um, would you rather hang out in Ocean Beach with Uncle Wayno? Yeah. Dean Gaffney and Callum Best? <laughs> or let Kurt Zuma look after your dog? Fuck. Uh, that, is a t that is a tough one. I would... I almost say because Zuma's got a penchant for cats, hasn't he? So I don't know if he's got, is he kicking dogs. Have we seen him kicking dogs? But also, I'd have a word with Zuma and say to him, "Listen, I know what you're about, you can. <laughs> I'll kick fuck out of you. I'll put you in a collar and I'll drag you around a car park uh, and a little. I put a little tail. I put one of them butt plugs up his arse with a tail on it, and I put a collar around him and I wibble, wibble him around. If I if he had thought it sort of said anything to Bert. Right. The top three people that you've played with. Yeah. If you was to have one last night out. Yeah. Who would your top three be? Top three people on the piss. Um, I would say um, Lawrence Delalio. He Big loves a night Laura. out. Big Lol. You should Google why, that, why he's good on a night out. I won't say it on here. Um, I'd obviously have Dozza. Yeah. And then who would be good for, for a tear up on a night out? Explain uh, to people who Dozza is. So, sorry, Paul Doran Jones again. Yeah. Sorry, Paul Doran Jones, former teammate and played for Gloucester. and. England is my best mate. We've got into, <laughs> and he features very heavily in both my books. Um, and he, you know, we've <laughs> we've had a few. We've got a few notches on the bedpost, a few battle scars yeah, to, yeah. To, to go with it. I'd Could you him, just quickly plug your two books that you've done? Yeah, yeah. Me? So I've done um, um, What a Flanker, uh, which is Thunder Times bestseller, and my new one, Ruck Me. Um, yeah, you'll love them. If you like any stories, I like the audios. Yeah, I love listening. Yeah. It's brilliant. <laughs> Mate, do you, I don't know if you've listened to Ruck Me, but the do, when Doz and I set up the porn business oh, I at school it, with the porn mags and. Uh, <laughs> And then we tried to burn them and they all blew off in the wind. And my mum couldn't understand why there was like fannies and tits all over the thing. And she didn't realise she'd been hoarding Europe's biggest collection of vintage porn mags. Oh, number three. Um, oh, who's really good on a, t on a night out that's like legendary? I reckon Simon Shaw would go quite well as well. Big yeah. Simon Shaw, yeah. Um, he's a man, for a man who's like six foot nine and is huge, Massive. he is um, very inconspicuous on a night out and always loves a tear up. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Loves a tear up. There you go. Fantastic. Um, very basic, this one. Best player you've played with and against? Best player I've played with, uh, I'd say with Jason Robinson. Yep. Um, I just love incredible. watching him play. Yeah, well, amazing. And then I'd say against the Brian O'Driscoll. Just really, yeah? utterly insane. I remember he, uh, one of my first games I played for Was. He got the ball at centre, chipped it over the top, ran round, volleyed it over the full-back, caught it and scored in the corner. And oh. I was like, I have absolutely none of that skill. you I'm out of my depth. Yeah, that's nice. But a, a lot of uh, people don't associate that type of skill with rugby players either, no, do they? No, you know he, I mean? he, was, he was like mercurial in his skill. Um, the biggest wanker you've ever met in the celebrity world? I mean, I don't want to cause some sort of beef. I would say there's a couple of people that I've met that you wanted, I wanted to be really good. I, I, I won't name them because I really can't be bothered with the drama, but I've just met a couple that... Are, are admired by people and admired by me, and I met them. And I was like, "You're a fuck, you're just a prick." Go on. I'm not going to say their name. On. I tried. Do you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, I tried to reserve judgment because people think the same thing about me. 
All right, all right. I'll leave it to the uh, I'll leave it to the viewers to sort of like guess who it is. Guess yeah. who it is. All right, sweet. Last question: Your biggest and proudest moment in your career, not your life, your career. I'd say um, winning the Six Nations. Winning, sorry, getting the Grand Slam in the Six Nations, 2016. We'd fallen, we failed three times before. Yeah. Lost against Wales twice. Sorry, Ireland twice, Wales once, and then went away to France after falling out of the uh, World Cup in 2015 pool stages, everyone was slagging us. Yeah, 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 it was Eddie Jones, I loved every single minute. And that week of that game, I had back spasm, wasn't sure I was gonna be able to play. Eddie just backed me all week. Yeah. Didn't have to train, didn't have to do anything. And um, That's that man management though. No, I mean, a lot of other people would have said, no, if you're not doing it, I managed to do a bit of it, got the back spasm, and I was, even on the day of the game, all day, because it was a night game, massage, he kept yeah. me moving, kept me moving, kept me moving. And I managed to play and we won, it was a game changer. Bosh!